Hello friends, this week I've been going back to the birth of cinema and then fast forwarding a little bit to watch some stuff from an era I haven't seen much of, the 1910s. Whilst these are pretty much copyright free because of their age, I'll admit they are a slightly more difficult watch for the average moviegoer, which may result in their ratings being slightly skewed towards film snobbery of my own. I've thought long and hard about how to review this next film. Ebear considered it good enough for a 4 out of 4 review and an entry to his great films list. The birth of a nation has divided critics for years. The film takes place during the American Civil War and follows two families from different sides of the border. Many of the young men in the families die. Lincoln's assassination ends the first act. In the second act, we see how the South deals with Reconstruction, and it's around here that things become decidedly offensive. Listing the film's good points, it is very well made. For 1915 especially, the battle sequences are immense, clearly big budget enough to show the kind of splendour and specification that later would have been easier to just CGI in. Within these battle sequences, there are vignettes that really make us feel for the characters. There's a personalisation and empathy for the soldiers that before this film had never been seen before. We're used to it now, but D.W. Griffith started this amongst other commonplace film occurrences, such as the close-up, which here was used to great effect. It's iconic for more reasons. It was the first film ever to be screened in the White House. It was also the longest film ever made at that point, and clocks in at three hours. Up until the interval, it's an of-its-time, very interesting film. It's a shame, a travesty, and absolutely awful. It's completely racist. Not that any more needs to be said, but as a fair review, all the intricacies and the beautiful cinematography were scarcely notable when any person watching could only concentrate on the blacked-up white actors, the racist stereotypes, and of course, the massive and obscene glorification of the KKK. It's because of this film that the KKK, then down to its last few members, received a resurgence and acceptance around the film's release in 1915. I will genuinely never be able to listen to The Rise of the Valkyries again. Some would say that Griffith's next film, Intolerance, was a sort of response to his anti-racist critics of The Birth of a Nation. Others are of the opinion it was him telling others to not be so intolerant to his views as a southerner. It's a much better film and less, what's the word the kids are using today? Problematic? The film opens with a woman rocking a cradle, a Lillian Gish cameo symbolising motherhood eternal, and a book being opened. This is the link between four stories that run parallel to one another. The story of Christ, which runs throughout the film and seems to end it, a French massacre, which I don't think was focused on enough, the fall of the Babylonian Empire, which to me seemed to be the biggest budget and the most interesting of spectacles, and finally, the smallest and in my mind best of the lot, a story about love. A woman falls in love with a striking worker, when he loses his job and is framed for theft, their child is taken away from the mother, here called the dear one. The boy comes out of prison and witnesses his old boss attempting to rape his wife. It's a little overcomplicated, but we feel for the characters and it's not hard to empathise with them. Slightly more anyway than Christ himself or a Babylonian prince. Like in Birth of a Nation, the spectacle scenes are the most impressive and clearly no expense has been spared. Enjoying this one is easier and guilt free. It's probably not of much interest to many people, but Todd Browning, the director of Freaks, worked as an AD on this movie. Broken Blossoms, or as the film was originally titled, Broken Blossoms or The Yellow Man and the Girl, is a much simpler film than Griffith's Intolerance, the three-year gap clearly inspiring him to make something with only three key players. The story follows Chen Huan, who is horribly referred to as various slurs throughout the titles, as he moves from China to London to preach of Buddha and pacifism. He falls in love with the young Lucy, who's played by Lillian Gish, a regular collaborator of D.W. Griffith. She lives with her father, the boxer battling Burroughs, a hard-drinking abuser who is truly terrifying. All the lead performances are excellent. Richard Barthelmus perfectly nuanced as Chen Quan. Donald Crisp as horribly evil as any patriarch before or since. It's interesting to note that there's a key scene where Lucy locks herself in a room to escape her father. He takes an axe to the door and it genuinely seems that Kubrick was heavily influenced by the scene for the similar one in The Shining. It's nearly shot for shot. Lillian Gish has never been better, her fear is tantamount to the viewers. We feel the fear and we feel the tension of her apologies to her father, desperate to say anything to avoid another whipping. I did really enjoy this one, but again it needs to be said, the heavy use of racist language by not only the characters, but also in the title cards, ruins it for me. It's just another Griffith film where the main actors are whitewashed versions. Something that stands out in particular in the scenes with actual people of Asian descent playing minor background characters. To something more fun now, Les Vampires is a French serial drama 
Think more along the lines of an event TV series broadcast in the cinema lasting around seven hours. It's long, but it's in nice bite-sized episodes that make it a good one to watch over a few nights. Whilst not about the mythical creature, Les Vampires is about a criminal gang called the Vampires, run by the head vampire, who changes in various episodes when the old one is killed or indisposed. He's helped by Irma Vep, nice bit of anagram, who, to me, was the real star of the show. She's a clear precursor to the femme fatale of the 30s, and an interesting villain. The series suffers considerably from the various storylines, some of which don't go anywhere, and you can't help but think it was written as it went on, as opposed to having a clear path laid out beforehand. The director, Louis Follet, directs well, but many of the scenes are reminiscent of the Victorian cinema's trend of having a pretty basic view of the scene with little camera movement or interesting shots. There's a few close-ups scattered throughout, but one which brought to mind the Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets reveal of I Am Lord Voldemort anagram rearrangement, which I thought looked very clever. It's an interesting series of films, and clearly it's been an inspiration for many crime thrillers since, with its many twists and turns. Thanks for watching. Next week, hopefully something more enjoyable and maybe less problematic.